Good afternoon. We want to thank the media representatives who have joined us for today's news event. My name is Kathy Dix Payne, Media Relations Manager with the Department of Health and Community Services, and I will be the moderator for the question and answer session. Joining us at the table are the Honorable John Hagee, Minister of Health and Community Services, and Dr. Roseanne Sevier, Acting Chief Medical Officer of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy, for the introduction, um, uh, and thank you for joining us. Joined with me uh, join uh, the table with me is uh, uh, a long-standing member of the public health team, Dr. Roseanne Sevier, and she has uh, stepped up uh, while Dr. Fitzgerald has her well-earned break this week and next, and she is our province's acting chief medical officer of health. The reason we've called uh, you together uh, is there's been some uh, lack of clarity and misinformation uh, that is out there about differences between self-monitoring, self-isolation, uh, and testing, particularly in reference to the, the latest uh, uh, media advisories from public health. And so uh, Dr. Sevier is here to provide that clarity uh, so that uh, going forward, people understand more clearly uh, the relative roles and importance of each of these as we move into a new era of contact tracing. So uh, Dr. Sevier. Oh, hi, and uh, good afternoon. And so first off, I'd like to say that if you have been contacted and told by public health to self-isolate, um, you should uh, continue that until you are released from self-isolation by public health. So I know you've heard so much, uh, you know, these are, are new times, and I know you've all heard about uh, contact tracing and, and uh, public health. We toss that term out there a lot. But uh, what I'd like to do today is to sort of explain a bit to you what that actually means and what we do. So when we have somebody who's diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, and so they, we call them a case, so um, we set our detectives in, um, in a, to action, and what they do is they contact that person, they um, get a list of their contacts um, very quickly, and then what, what we uh, proceed to do then is to contact those, uh, those people who we call the contacts, and uh, we tend to isolate them, especially those ones that we determine are at risk, um, and that have a close contact, we would isolate them. And of course we do that, we sort of draw a tight circle around our case and we isolate them to prevent any further spread. We then test them and uh, it, we continue isolation if they are a high risk contact, such as somebody who lives with, with a case. So in the situation that's happened uh, yesterday, um, when you have somebody that, uh, we have a case and, and they were in a store or a community center or, or a, commu a place in the community, a restaurant, what happens is as much as they might want to tell us who their contacts are, they really have no capacity to say, oh, I, I saw so-and-so in the store. Or, um, so we're not able to do that uh, contact tracing that we rely on. So in, instead, what, what we do do is um, we send out a, a public general public message and we talk about the place that the person um, was, uh, was attending and wh wh when, while they were infectious. We talk about the time they were there. And then in these circumstances, we know that the risk is low. This is not somebody who had a close contact with prolonged time. But we sort of define contact as, as sort of longer than 15 minutes. So we know when somebody's in a grocery store, um, such as, say, in these circumstances, and they had contacts, the only way we can reach those people um, is to say, if you were in this store, if you were in this place during this period of time, we ask you please uh, to, to get tested. 
And we also, because the risk is low, we don't say to you, go home, shut your door, um, self-isolate. Instead, what we do say is we'd like you to monitor for symptoms. And, uh, and should you get symptoms, then, of course, the whole uh, decision tree changes. Because we're saying this to all of you, if you're, if you're sick, you know, stay home. If you have symptoms, please, look, uh, please go to the uh, government website. Please fill out the algorithm or on your Thrive app on your, on your phone. And uh, if, you're, if the algorithm tells you that you um, should be tested, then call 811. 811 will arrange testing for you. So I know this is difficult times, and it's a real change in how we see the world. Because uh, before, your mom sent you to school um, with your arm hanging off and, and tucked close under your, your other arm. So, but the, those are not the days anymore. And we really need to um, stay home if you're sick. We need to um, also follow all the other public health measures. You know, one of the most important ones is, is keeping that physical distance and also hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette. And I, I want to take this opportunity to thank the people of Newfoundland. You've obviously done a wonderful job. You've, you've self-isolated when we've asked you to. None of these things are easy. You've gone to get tested when you, when you have symptoms, even though mom told you it was okay to be out there. So I, I want to take this opportunity. You know, our epidemiology is, is good. We've successfully opened schools. We've kept community transmission. We don't have community transmission. We're so privileged, and I really do want to say thank you to the people of Newfoundland because you are the reason that that is, that is the case. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sevier. And I think it's important to draw that distinction between degrees of contact. And so simply the fact that you're having a COVID test doesn't necessarily mean that you have to isolate unless your contact is close and unless public health have specifically advised you to do this. We've seen a shift now to what we are calling location-based tracing rather than person-based. And because of that, um, we have the advantage now of the COVID alert app. Um, Dr. Sevier re um, referenced uh, Thrive, which was our version, which has now been rolled into the COVID alert app. So if there's any confusion there, that's kind of the old name we used in-house here for the project at the beginning. But the facts of the case are the more people who have this app, the more people who we're aware of through location-based um, discussions, uh, can avail of testing, but again, it's self-monitoring for those individuals rather than self-isolation. This doesn't affect any of the other categories of individuals for whom we have recommendations, such as essential workers, rotational workers, international rotational workers, and people who travel on exemptions for compassionate grounds. Um, the other piece that's arisen specifically in the uh, context of this case uh, concerns the PAL flight from Deer Lake. Um, essentially, if you are on the leg from Deer Lake to Goose Bay at that time on the Tuesday, uh, you should seek advice from 811. If, however, you got off the plane in Deer Lake or indeed you didn't get on the plane until Goose Bay, there is no risk, and you do not need to do anything except follow common sense, hygiene, public health guidelines. Those people who were on the plane, uh, either going to Goose Bay or stopping in Goose Bay and then going on to Warbush, if you were on the plane during the Deer Lake to Goose Bay leg, call 811. Uh, I think that is really the message that we needed to get out here today about the different degrees of um, caution for individuals. Uh, so self-monitoring for um, distant, unlikely, low-risk, um, passing in the corridor almost kind of things uh, versus isolation and testing for those who are definite contacts with uh, close exposure. It goes back to Dr. Fitzgerald's mantra about people, space, time, and place. And again, that will be your guide. So I think with that, uh, Kathy, I'll, I'll pause there and maybe we can turn it over to the media for any questions they may have. Thank you, Minister. For the benefit of our speakers, we have four reporters registered for today's call. We will conduct the question and answer session in two rounds where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. If time permits, there will be an opportunity for further questions. Reporters will ask questions in the order they registered for today's call. 
Our first questions are from Peter Jackson of the Telegram. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, the woman in Labrador who tested positive, uh, did she attend the two stores mentioned in the alert? And if so, was that a violation of uh, health measures? Um, that's a very good question, Peter. We're looking into the entire circumstances of what happened between the individual getting off the plane and uh, um, going for a COVID test. That investigation is still ongoing. Uh, there has been a suggestion that this has happened, and so we have, out of an abundance of caution, issued the uh, location-based advisory. Once that investigation is complete, I'll be in a better position to answer that question. Uh, if a person is uh, in contact, uh, close contact, for example, with someone who has COVID and then that person goes to the store, would that be a situation that would trigger an alert? The issue uh, under the COVID alert app, uh, certainly that can do that. You remember that's a consent-based app, so uh, it would require uh, the individual who was positive to have the app uh, and uh, allow for consent to release that information. Um, the issue of what happens to close contacts is clear. It's well established through public health. They call 811. They will be identified uh, as a high, uh, prob uh, a high a close contact, uh, and they will uh, be asked to isolate until uh, tested and then for 14 days. Thank you. Our next questions are from Jody Cook of NTV News. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. We're seeing on social media some really significant lineups for testing in the uh, region area of Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, kilometers and kilometers long. Uh, do you have any concerns about facilitating that, or is there a message that you want to send to residents, whether they you even feel that it's necessary? I think there's significant concern in the population there. Certainly from my point of view, I've been made aware through um, our uh, local MHAs that this is a, uh, um, an issue that has uh, generated significant anxiety and concern. I think uh, the reasons for going and getting a test are very clear. Either you have been identified by public health as a close contact, or you fall into the categories related to flight PAL 901, or the two stores referenced at the times referenced. Other people do not need to go and get tested, and I would encourage them not to do that at the moment because it is displacing potentially the other categories who should get tested. We are in discussions with Labrador Grenfell to ensure that the, uh, the testing and the personnel are sufficient, uh, but we opted not to have an intermediate step whereby we had a phone line uh, for appointments and simply open it up to people at their own discretion to, to use the categories we've given to guide those who should be there. So if you're in the queue and you happen to live in Happy Valley Goose Bay, you weren't on the flight, you weren't at those stores, and you didn't go to the health center, don't sit in the queue, go home. We know we were notified yesterday that our finance minister uh, was in a hotel in Deer Lake that was listed late yesterday. Uh, we were also told that out of an abundance of caution that she would be taking a COVID test today. Is she a close contact with that positive and would she fit under that clarification? Um, I, at the risk of speaking for Dr. Sevier, um, no. The close contact is someone who spent significant period of time, certainly greater than 15 minutes, closer than six feet to someone who's tested positive. That does not apply, and it is similar to the individuals we're referencing in the store or on the plane. These are, if you like, casual uh, passing uh, acquaintances almost, if you want to use that word, and it probably isn't the right one, uh, and the risk uh, is minimal to absolutely zero. And what we have suggested, what Dr. Sevier's categorization is, is that people in this group should self-monitor but uh, voluntarily go and get a test. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what um, uh, my colleague has done. Thank you. Our next questions are from Linda Swain of VOCM News. Please go ahead. 
Hi there. Have any further positive cases been identified associated with this particular case? We've had no positive cases of the, the run this morning uh, at Public Health. Uh, Goose Bay have their own equipment called the Gene Expert, uh, and they are using that, but the tests are also being sent to St. John's uh, and regarded as presumptive until then. Uh, none new have been identified. The afternoon run results are not yet in, uh, and when they are, we'll update our uh, website as per usual. Have any presumptive cases been identified? No. Our next questions are from Peter Callan of CBC News. Please go ahead. This person was a healthcare worker. We didn't see in the news release really any addressing of uh, exposure while they were at work. Can you give us an idea of how many people may have been exposed as part of uh, this person's role in the health profession? That's certainly a question that was prominent in my mind. Uh, the Labrador Grenfell are compiling that list. Uh, what happens is simultaneously that goes to public health so they can arrange for um, uh, appropriate advice. But at the moment, I don't have those numbers yet. Uh, and I have encouraged, again, Lab Grenfell to provide them to me at the earliest opportunity. You talked uh, just a minute ago about the risk being minimal to absolutely zero for people who weren't in close contact. Uh, but at the same time, you're telling people that they should go get tested. So explain, I guess, the contradiction there that on the one hand, you're saying the risk is extremely low. On the other hand, people are now feeling anxious because they've told that the risk is high enough that they should still get a test. Do you want to answer that? Sure. And, and I can really understand that anxiety. I, I think COVID-19 causes a lot of anxiety in, in, uh, in, in many of us. It's new. It's novel. Uh, it, it's uh, changing. We learn something new about it every, every couple of weeks. But um, so when we have, and, and um, as I uh, explained before, when we use our contact tracing really to, to really draw a tight circle around uh, cases and, and their contacts, and in this circumstance, um, you're absolutely correct, the, the risk is low, but out of an abundance of caution, we, we, we say, um, you know, if you were in this area, then uh, we would recommend testing, but that in acknowledgement of the risk being low, we do not say you, you need to uh, go home and, and self-isolate if you don't have symptoms. So, and then we ask you to self-monitor. And that really is um, because um, even, even though the risk is low, when we take a test like that, it gives us more information. It makes, make, lets us make sure that there has been no further transmission. It does line up nicely with the COVID alert app. Um, one of the changes, this principal change, was done in conjunction with national um, coordination so that the, uh, the jurisdictions that have this app uh, out and enabled in their, uh, uh, in their province uh, or territory uh, can get the most information. Uh, it's about completeness of information in this setting. We are not in the situation, fortunately, of places like Ontario or Alberta. And so we have the ability to do this testing and to add value to COVID Alert App. It will only be of value to the general population in a really significant way, however, if we can improve our uptake of that. Uh, currently, across the country, 10% uh, of the population would appear to have downloaded the app. Uh, we need 80% to get there. And I would like to add to that because I'd like to put my plug in also for the COVID app. I have it on my phone uh, the first week it came out. And uh, I would really like to encourage people to um, download that on their phone. And really how that app works is, it, it, is if some, but somebody is a case, they get a special code, they put that code into their phone, and, and uh, it alerts people who have been in close contact via Bluetooth. That information does not come back to public health, so it is not like a, a, um, a, the traditional public health contact tracing uh, that we would do, but it allows us to have uh, people who, who had the contact um, to be alerted that they were in contact with a positive case and gives us the option then to, to test these people to see if there was any transmission. So it's another tool. I mean, this is the incredible thing that I've seen since, uh, you know, the start of COVID, all the new tools that have been put in the public health um, uh, toolbox, as I call it, or our, 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 our detective um, kit, if you like. And the COVID app is a really important one for us, and I would really like to encourage people 
um, to download that and uh, help us uh, keep the province safe. Our next question is from Peter Jackson of the Telegram. Please go ahead. Um, hi. The, uh, the Labrador, uh, of course, is very um, worried about the spread of disease. It's, uh, it's been a problem all along that coast. Um, and this particular co-op, I'm told, is very busy. It's also on the way out of town to other communities. So uh, isn't there a considerable risk of spread to other re regions of Labrador now? From my point of view, on the advice of public health, the short answer is no, uh, because of the um, potential fleeting uh, interaction uh, between our index case and any single individual who may or may not have been in that store. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very low. We do recognize Happy Valley Goose Bay is a significant hub uh, for the area and the North Coast. Uh, and that has been part of our uh, abundance of caution approach uh, around uh, uh, putting out there as early as we could the information around the stores, for example, on the flight. Uh, I, I understand that the, the hospital there, uh, because they have a number, they have a lot of locum, that they, uh, uh, they have taken extra precautions. They're, they're particularly uh, careful in that case. But what measures would the province uh, uh, be willing to take to make sure in such a vulnerable area that uh, that visitors uh, to the province are better monitored? It's an excellent question. One of our um, uh, strengths in some respects is that we do have a, a vibrant visiting uh, healthcare provider uh, culture. There are people who want to come and work here, even though they don't live here. It's a very appealing place to work. One of our paradoxes is that uh, we have recruitment challenges as well. And Labrador Grenfell particularly has uh, a long tradition of utilizing visiting essential workers, uh, without which, in actual fact, a lot of the services that they have would either have to be curtailed significantly or, or even stopped. So um, across the RHAs, there is um, a requirement to onboard um, uh, physicians, particularly since COVID, and make them aware of uh, the requirements uh, for essential workers. Uh, indeed, anyone with an exemption is given a link to the requirements that they need to follow uh, as a result of their exemption. Um, uh, the investigation that we're doing at the moment will hopefully uh, support those uh, measures, and if they find uh, areas where we can improve or strengthen them, then we'll certainly be uh, acting swiftly to do that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Jody Cook of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. From an employer's perspective, even an employee one, when feeling like they should perhaps fall into the category of self-monitoring, can you just explain to us how that means what that means for their day to day. Can they go to work? Can they continue their daily lives? What do employers and employees need to know? Um, yes. So self monitoring means you can you can continue your daily life. You can go to work. You can. Children can go to school. So what what they would do is follow the the. Uh, public health advice that's out there for everybody to wear a mask in indoor places, to wash your hands frequently, to use respiratory etiquette, to keep a distance. So all those, all those same measures would apply um, that every one of us should be uh, living in COVID days. And, and I will say COVID days aren't going to last forever. And I, I know these, some of these measures um, are not easy, but I think we're you know, adapting and getting used to them. So that's what uh, self-monitoring self, uh, means, is really monitoring you, yourself for those symptoms. And uh, those symptoms are on um, the um, algorithm um, that's on uh, the government website. And, uh, and if, if then somebody had those symptoms, that would, of course, change what they, what they did. And uh, we encourage them then to call 811 for testing. And I don't know if that you can answer this follow-up question. Um, I understand that there's an investigation underway for whether or not this person did self-isolate. There's been no charges laid historically yet in this province for someone who may not have. Would that be a consideration in this case or in any case should you find that the person did not self-isolate? The um, requirements are there for a reason to protect uh, everybody, um, but particularly uh, the public of Labrador and, and Newfoundland. 
Um, the investigation is ongoing, and at the end of that, there, there will be some options uh, depending on the findings. Uh, the bottom line is, if in a very simplistic way, there have been significant breaches of the requirements, there will have to be consequences. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Our next questions are from Linda Swain of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Hi, this is actually Jeff my stepping in. Um, so anyone traveling from uh, to the, the coast of Labrador from the island would presumably fly from Deer Lake to Happy Valley Goose Bay before going to the north coast. What kind of resources are available for COVID testing in coastal Labrador communities? The arrangement with um, Labrador Grenfell revolves around uh, the uh, First Nations uh, Inuit Health Branch, uh, who have supplied additional test kits and um, equipment for, uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay and the North Coast. Exactly how those would be deployed to the North Coast, I think, would be an issue for Labrador Grenfell. But they have three gene expert machines uh, on site, uh, and they, uh, they have the kits to, um, to deal with those. And we also have access to other kits. In terms of public health resources, again, the exact numbers of folk would have to be uh, discussed with Labrador Grenfell, but I know Nunatsi Arvut have their own public health nurses as well who work in tandem with Labrador Grenfell staff. Uh, and that's a very well-tested, well-tried collaborative arrangement. In terms of physicians, um, there is the COVID plan at Labrador Health Center. Uh, there are ventilators on site. There is a facility to stabilize sick patients. Uh, because of the nature of Labrador and its healthcare structure, traditionally patients requiring a certain level of care have always uh, been uh, air medevaced to uh, usually the tertiary center in St. John's because there are uh, indigenous support mechanisms particularly uh, set up there. And uh, can you tell us where the positive case is right now? Uh, the positive case is in Happy Valley Goose Bay. I'm sorry, are there any specifics? Are they Excuse me? isolating? You, have, oh, you sorry. have one question and one follow-up, so in the third round you can ask your additional question. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Why aren't we doing uh, point of entry testing for healthcare workers, considering they do have substantial interactions with vulnerable populations? Things like we're doing for the rotational workers. When you arrive, get a test. It's not foolproof, but it might identify some cases. We don't actually do point of entry testing for rotational workers. We test between day five and day seven, and there's a reason for that. I don't know if Dr. Sevia wants to elaborate further. Sure. I, I think, uh, you know, and, and we've looked at this uh, long and hard, and we've consulted with uh, colleagues across this country with the chief MOHs of various provinces and territories. And uh, the general consensus is when you, when you test like that upon arrival, um, the test, like any test, it's not perfect. And um, if somebody is early in the disease, they're false, they, have, they can be a false negative. And that also then gives people the confidence because, you know, most people think, well, I'm negative, I'm good to go. And instead, we have chosen that it, we would require people to um, isolate because we know that that's a, a more effective means of... Um, of uh, of preventing transmission. So we, when we, with the rotational workers, we chose to, to choose day five to seven because we know that we have a more likely um, chance of, get, of ca actually catching the virus at that, at that point. It decreases our risk of having a false negative test. And uh, that, that is why we, we chose that uh, period of point with uh, a period of time with lots of um, thought and uh, consultation from across the country. I really wish that um, we had a great test that I could test um, everybody as they uh, uh, crossed a land border or came the ferry or the plane, but that is not actually our, our circumstances at the moment. Um, who knows what, what's coming down the pipeline? There's always new tests that we evaluate, but at the moment um, that's the best thing we can do with the, the tests that, that we have available, and we're thankful that we at least have that. But with healthcare workers, they are not isolating when they're at work. They're interacting with patients, especially if you're a doctor or a nurse or someone who's on the front lines of providing care. So considering the fact that they do have substantial interactions with other people, why not do that testing considering it may not capture all the cases, but it might, in fact, capture some? 
So in, instead of doing the test, then we uh, rely more on a, try and tr a tried and true that they um, they have all their measures at work. And uh, as you know, and if I don't know if you've visited a healthcare uh, facility recently, but there's uh, stringent controls within the healthcare facility which all healthcare workers um, would follow. And and there's a uh, you know all shift masking. And then um, it's only and outside of work, we ask them then to. Uh, to isolate completely while they're while they're not at work. So this is for us the best uh, possible choice in, in at the, at this moment in time with the, with the tools we have in terms of preventing transmission from um, healthcare workers entering the province. Peter Jackson, do you have any further questions? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask. This is a, might go back to uh, to Dr. Savior's uh, distinctions that she was making earlier, but. Is the person in um, Happy Valley who was told not to isolate and then was told to isolate and then a co-worker who was told to isolate but now can go back to work um, and they, they visited the co-op. If you visit that co-op, um, does that necessarily mean you're going to be given a, a standard uh, protocol to follow? So, so I, I want to just reiterate one thing clear message that if you were contacted by public health, anybody in this province who's contacted by public health and told to self-isolate, that they should um, self-isolate, and this does not apply to them, and that they should continue that self-isolation until released by public health. But if you uh, if you attended the, the co-op, then it would be to self-monitor, and it would be to check for, for symptoms and to get tested. So, and, and we do that because we know the risk there is, is low, and uh, and so they, that they do not need to uh, self-isolate and remove themselves from um, society, if you will. Okay, thank you. Jody Cook, do you have any further questions? Yeah, I just want to clarify something, just to make sure I understand it perfectly. So uh, we know that this person was an essential health care worker. Um, we don't have to know what capacity they worked in. Did they ever attend uh, any sort of a health facility in Happy Valley Blue Bay or the destination? The information that we have is that the individual did work uh, for uh, shifts uh, during part of the period between their arrival and them getting tested. Thanks. Je Jeff Smyth, do you have a further question? No, but thank you very much. Peter Cowan, do you have a further question? I'm good to go. Well, thank you very much, folks, for tuning in, and have a great evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.